Thank you, Sean, and thanks to everyone who joined today. Uh, our next platform helps drive open source policy and faster remediation through the entire software development lifecycle, uh, while also educating developers on how to use higher quality open source components through IDE integration. As you know, companies use open source code to build enterprise applications quickly. Modern applications today are typically made up of 85% open source components. So how do you manage the quality and quantity of open source your developers are procuring every day? This is why our customers chose the Nexus platform to utilize better components, automate policy for critical open source vulnerabilities and costly licensing through four key products. Our Nexus firewall automatically stops risk from entering the SDLC by enforcing policies and proxying to public repositories. The Nexus repository centrally stores and manages libraries and builds artifacts used across the entire SDLC. Nexus lifecycle works within every phrase of the SDLC uh, to continuously identify risk, enforce policies, uh, reduce mean time to remediation, and integrate with developer IDEs. Nexus Auditor examines open source risk in production and legacy apps that are no longer going through development. Uh, the entire platform is powered by our Nexus IQ, uh, our intelligence engine, which includes precise and actionable security license and quality metadata curated by more than 80 full-time researchers. If you have further questions, my contact info will be posted at the end of Paul's presentation, and you can ask me about uh, Dog Vader then. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And then, uh, Paul, if you are ready, we would love to hear from you. I am. Can you hear me? Sound good. Good. And uh, Tony D, if you could stop sharing, that would be awesome. Thank you. All right, so let me share my presentation. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share with you guys today. I do appreciate it. And uh, uh, as uh, Sean had said, we're going to be looking at exemplars, laggards, and hoarders. Uh, and, and so as we get into this, I'm going to start with a quote uh, from uh, uh, Neil Beiersdorf. It says, an organization's journey to excellence begins once it sees sacrifice to sacrifice quality for speed. And I think oftentimes as we're in DevOps and we look at, you know, we want to move fast. We want to go quick. We tend to sacrifice quality and, and introduce risk into our applications for the sake of having speed. And how do we avoid doing that? And, and then before I get uh, deep into this, I wanted to say, you know, first of all, why am I concerned about this? Why is my company Sonatype? Uh, involved in this as well. You know, from a summer type perspective, we were uh, got involved, our, our CTO and founder and, and the rest of the team got involved in Apache Maven uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, which is kind of a start on the open source sharing of open source components and such. Uh, soon after doing that, they created something called Central Repo or Central Repository, where a lot of open source Java components are stored. Uh, and, and so we've picked up a lot and helped the community a lot with, uh, with that type of uh, activity. Then we created a uh, repository that you could have inside your network. Uh, and that allows you to uh, have that same type of functionality inside your network instead of relying on the repositories external to your network. Uh, and one, as we looked at it, we said, hey, we've got a lot of data about this. Let's create some, uh, some, some tools that fit into the DevOps space uh, and really work well with that. And then over the last five years or so, we've been uh, putting out what we call the Software Supply Chain Report or the Annual State of the Software Supply Chain uh, Report. Uh, last year was our fifth year. 2019 this year, we're gonna be coming out with another one in another month or two. So here in the middle of summer, we'll do that. And as for myself, uh, I've, uh, you know, back in 2003, I got involved in, uh, joined Red Hat and, and really learned a lot about open source and licensing and stuff like that. So it's just been a passion of mine uh, since that time. Now, speaking of uh, reports and such, uh, I'm sure many of us are familiar with Nicole Forsgren. Uh, she's uh, been a part of the uh, DORA organization or, or a DevOps research and assessment uh, organization. She's also written a book called Accelerate the Science of Lean Software and, and DevOps. Uh, and uh, in the reports that she's put out over the last uh, five or six years or so, they look at different things like what it was about uh, open source uh, that uh, people really like, or, or how does it help organizations and teams? And one of the things they discovered in 2018 was that the high-performing uh, DevOps inter, uh, companies or organizations uh, were able to to deploy 46 times faster than the, the low-end organizations or uh, less mature organizations. 2019, last year, over 200 times faster. So definitely is something that's been picking up speed and, and, and they've been growing with and, and working, we've been working with as an, as an industry over time. Uh, and, and so it's something that's very, very useful. Now, last year, after we uh, got our results back from our survey and we started looking at that kind of stuff, we, we thought, you know, wouldn't it 
be great to be able to team up with some other people inside the industry. So we uh, teamed up with Gene Kim, uh, Dr. Stephen McGill, uh, Bruce Mayhew, uh, Derek Weeks, uh, one of our uh, uh, evangelists, and, and, and sat down and looked at the data and, and went through some different things. And, and some of the things that we uh, looked at is and, and made a lot of sense. And, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about these different hypotheses that we came up with and the results. Did, were we able to validate or not validate those hypotheses as we go through, uh, as, as we look at this? Now, we look at it and say, you know, everybody that's developing software has a software supply chain. We may not recognize it as such, but it really is. And if you look at this, you can see on the right hand side, we've got the finished goods. What, what does that mean? That's the applications that we're creating. What are the manufacturers, the processes creating that? That's going to be our software development teams. Uh, the warehouses are going to be the component repositories or our source repositories where we're storing uh, the bits and parts of the application. And what are our suppliers? In this case, if we're looking at open source components as being the suppliers. Now, when we're talking about open source components, what, what are we talking about here? What's the, the, the volume of stuff that we're looking at? And, and so a couple of examples, and this is really uh, common across uh, the, the, the the more common or popular uh, ecosystems, uh, but here we're looking at Java uh, and and NPM. And over the last uh, what five or six years, you know, look at the number of downloads for Java components on an annual basis, and we're approaching 50, 150 billion downloads of these different components for Java. Uh, the weekly downloads of NPM packages uh, again is approaching you know somewhere between 10 and 15, uh, 12 billion. Uh, downloads uh, a week. Uh, so it really is uh, accelerating and we're seeing this exponential growth and we look at these downloads as a proxy or a indication of the amount of build automation that we're seeing out there, which is a good thing. It means DevOps is taking, taking root and people are really digging into that. Now, when you look at uh, the, the amount of open source that's being consumed and the amount of the, that that's out there, uh, we also have to stop and look and say, well, what about our applications? How much of our applications are being, uh, of those open sources being consumed in our applications? And in this, you know, a modern application, uh, our research has shown that uh, it can be as much as 85% of your source code or of your application comes from external resources, from open source components. Uh, and, and so that's, a, you know, a significant part of the applications out there. And it makes total sense. That's how we're able to be able to uh, innovate very quickly because we're not writing everything from scratch. Uh, going back to the uh, uh, state of the DevOps uh, report last year, uh, as they were doing analysis of the data, they were able to determine that the high performers were using um, a much bigger mix of open source components as opposed to proprietary code. So again, it goes back to uh, supporting this type of, uh, of number here. Now, uh, and I'll, I'll approach it several times throughout this, uh, this talk, but not all open source components are created equal. Uh, some of them might have some vulnerabilities or issues inside of them. And for example, in the Java world, uh, over the last few years, I've seen this number switch somewhere between, you know, hover right around 10%, sometimes a little below, like here about 9%, sometimes a little bit higher, 11, 12%. Um, and, and so that's probably pretty close to most of the ecosystems across the, the spectrum. However, some of them, such as JavaScript, uh, might be quite a bit higher. Uh, research has shown that JavaScript has as much as 50% um, of the components out there have some type of vulnerability in them. So something to be aware of. And as you're looking at it and saying, okay, I'm building these applications on this stuff, uh, how do I make sure I'm using the right components? Now, yeah, as, as uh, the State of the DevOps report and the DORA organization has, has shown, faster is better in the enterprise. Being able to innovate or, or deploy faster means that we're uh, creating new versions of the software, we're operating faster. Uh, and so this is all a, a really good thing from, from that standpoint for enterprises, uh, or companies and, and things like that. But what about open source? Is faster better for open source? And if it is better, then how do we make sure we pick the best suppliers? How do we make sure that we're getting the right stuff from those? And we'll talk about this as we go, go through here. Now, we're dealing with a couple of different uh, aspects or, or different uh, things here. Uh, in, in comparing the open source world with um, such things as um, enterprise and, uh, or, or open source. Uh, so in the enterprise, what we're looking at is multiple de deploys per day. How quickly can we inter uh, innovate in our code? 
Uh, we also typically have a consistent development team. Uh, we have people, employees that we've hired, or contractors that we've hired on for a, a specific period of time. And most of the time, they're predictable, well-resourced. There's a budget for the compute environment that they're going to be deploying into uh, and, and things like that. Contrast that with the open source world, and we're looking really more at uh, version releases uh, and, and not quite the same uh, frequency, uh, probably a bit slower, a fluid group of developers. People on these teams come and go, uh, and it depends upon where they're at in their own life. Maybe they change jobs and they don't have that freedom to be able to work on open source components. Uh, and the availability of resources is quite variable. Sometimes there may be uh, some resources from an open source uh, foundation or something like that. And many times it's just what these people are able to uh, provide on their own. Now, some of these things are pretty easy to understand uh, as we go through this. We'll look at those, and some of them will require a little bit more uh, digging into the details, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we get into that. So we started out with a fairly large data set, over 250,000 different components we're looking at, and we broke that down into different uh, different uh, attributes that we were looking for. So does it have at least two versions? Is it a part of a software supply chain? Is it a dependency, or are there dependencies for it? Uh, what's the numbering mechanism for it, or versioning guidance, uh, different things like that. And we broke that down and ended up coming out with about the 36,000 components that we were able to analyze for, for this uh, study. Uh, attributes we were looking at for, for such things as popularity, uh, how many downloads does it have, the size of the team, development speed, how many commits per month, so on and so forth. So a lot of these things are pretty uh, easily understood, but some of the things such as security and update, speed uh, might be a little bit more complicated, so we'll dig into some charts that show some of this a little bit later. So here's our first hypothesis. The first one is projects that release frequently have better outcomes. Now, if I had a little bit more time, I'd probably do a little poll and say, okay, what do you guys think? Is, is, is this an accurate thing or uh, is, is, is this inaccurate? What do you think? Is it validated or not? We were able to validate that. So as we were looking at the, uh, the data and, and studying that, we were able to come up with uh, statistics such as uh, these projects that release frequently are five times more popular. Uh, they attract uh, 79, almost 80% more developers, uh, and oftentimes they'll have greater foundation support rates, so more, more resources or dedicated resources to them. So, so that all makes sense. Now, if we look at some slightly different statistics here, for example, mean time to restore, mean time to remediate vulnerabilities, most of us are probably in an environment, uh, you know, or a company environment or enterprise environment, where we understand this, understand this mean time to restore. The alternative uh, for uh, uh, open source components is mean time to remediate vulnerabilities. How long does it take to fix uh, issues that, that are inside that code? Now, we lean heavily on uh, the work of Edwards Deming. If you're not familiar with him, he was a gentleman that was very uh, instrumental in Japan, uh, helping Japanese manufacturers after World War II rebuild their processes and such. Uh, and he had a number of things that uh, he would study and say and, and advocate to those uh, organizations, uh, such things as source materials from the best suppliers, source only the best parts from those top suppliers, uh, trace and track the location of every part from start to finish, uh, and provide a bill of materials of being able to uh, make sure that you know where everything went uh, at the end of that. Other things he focused on was cease dependence on mass inspection. Another way to put that is you cannot inspect quality into a product. You gotta make sure you have good stuff coming in at the beginning. So to continue looking at this, some of the key metrics we're looking at to try to you know, focus in on that quality at the beginning is these uh, statistics such as mean time to remediate, uh, uh, time to update uh, in stale dependencies. Now, how does this play out inside of, say, an application? So I've got a hypothetical application that's got, let's say, three different dependencies on it. I actually have a direct dependency or calling into my code, this uh, component called C. Uh, and that then has its own two dependencies, both A and B. So those are what I would call transitive dependencies because I'm not bringing them in directly. Now, uh, and C has a uh, component B in there, uh, and, and over a period of time, there's a vulnerability discovered in component B. Uh, and so there's a period of time where we're vulnerable with that. Uh, and, and so what we're trying to track uh, in this study is what is that time of vulnerability, both for B and for C, uh, and then what's that remediation time once B gets fixed for C to then uh, consume that uh, fix. And so that's the update time uh, for, for B to come in. And then we're also looking for, at the update time for C 
uh, I'm sorry for component A because uh, component C skipped the stale dependency. So how long does it take for it to bring in uh, that, that new component? And the reason these things are important is because, as I mentioned earlier, open source, it, well, it doesn't age like wine. It, it ages like milk. Uh, now, this is contrary to that statement. Here's a jug of milk that's going to last forever because I'm still waiting for February 30th to roll over my calendar. Until then, I'm sure this is going to be a, a great, uh, great jug of milk there. Now, Looking at those uh, components that we pulled out or the open source projects we pulled out and, and focused on for the study, uh, we've, we found some very interesting and on, in some ways disturbing um, uh, results here. The mean time or the median time to repair if you found a vulnerability component was 180 days. Uh, yeah, that's about half a year, isn't it? Uh, the mean time to repair, the mean time uh, for that uh, is uh, approaching a year, 326 days, and the 95th percentile meaning that 5% of these components aren't even fixed after three and a half years. So there's a lot of time out there. But what, how do we fix this? How do we focus on those things that would tell us what these com, uh, quality components are? And that's going to be focusing on those ones that you know, update faster and quicker. Um, and, and so that's you know, fixing those remediations. But what about stale dependencies? And, and the nice thing here is that when we overlay that green on top of this, we can see that the, the mean time to update, bringing, you know, updating the stale dependencies, getting rid of the older stuff, is, is a fairly close curve to, to that. So, so that was a, you know, a good thing to look at. And that made us think of another hypothesis, and that is projects that update dependencies more frequently are generally more secure. That makes sense, but what about the data? Does the data prove that out? Yes, indeed. The data does prove that out. It does show that those dependencies do update more frequently. Uh, those that update frequently uh, are generally more secure. Uh, of course, there's always going to be some outliers out there, but in this case, that's, that's a, a truism. And so we discovered about 55% of these components have a mean time to repair, a mean time to update within 20% of each other. Uh, and, but a small number of those maintain a better than average uh, mean time to repair. So that's something that we definitely want to keep track of uh, and, and monitor as we go throughout this. So our next hypothesis is projects with fewer dependencies will stay more up to date. And, and that makes a lot of sense. It seems like if there's fewer things to keep track of, you would want to be able to, it would be easier to keep up, up to date with those things. Interestingly enough, that did not prove out to be true. Uh, we could not find a correlation between fewer dependencies uh, and, and, and keeping those dependencies up to date. Uh, here's a little bit of data about that. Interestingly enough, as we look at this data and started to try to comprehend it and understand it, we found a, a, a interesting uh, corollary here or, or parallelism. When you look at it, some of the smaller teams tended to not have as quite as good a mean time to repair or mean time to update as some of the larger teams. Uh, and so it kind of broke down into like a two, uh, a two uh, peak to team tended to do better uh, with this kind of stuff uh, than uh, those that may not be, be that way. Uh, and, and so we were able to find out that larger development teams tend to have about a 50% faster mean time to update uh, and, and release, you know, about two and a half times more, more quickly. Um, so then that leads into our fourth and last hypothesis for today, and that is more popular projects will be better about staying up to date. Now, in a lot of ways, that makes sense. Uh, and, and kind of where this idea comes from is this gentleman here, Eric Raymond. He uh, wrote a book back in 1999 called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And in that, he discussed an idea, uh, a rule uh, commonly called Lin uh, Linus's Law, uh, from Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, uh, in uh, I guess in official language it is, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. Uh, putting it in, in more simpler, more understandable, understandable terms, we could say with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Yeah. Now, whereas that makes sense, unfortunately, that prob uh, hypothesis did not prove out to be true. We were able to find that there's a lot of uh, components out there that uh, have plenty of uh, popular components or have poor mean time to update and mean time to repair. Um, and, and so as we looked at that, um, it seems that the exponential curve of everything going on with that is um, uh, going on. Um, we can't keep up with it. We divided these groups into different uh, teams uh, and, and we're working with them. Uh, and so we looked at small, large laggards uh, and, and whatnot, trying to 
get different popular different uh, organizations on that. We're able to chart them out and see some things like this. And, and so when you're looking at your open source components, you want to pick over on the left hand side here uh, and rather than from from that over there. As we looked at how do we apply this to um, uh, to the uh, Hey Paul, I'm, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt. We're at a two minute warning. Okay, thank you, Sean. I will keep going there. Uh, and, and so these these characteristics, these attitudes, or these uh, attributes that we see, what we often see inside of uh, uh, enterprises, also plays out well with uh, open source components. Uh, and, and so, um, taking that back into the enterprise, what we really want to be able to see here is that the enterprise development uh, developers manage dependencies. When you put these practices into place, what it really means is that you end up making your life or your developers less painful, which means they're going to stick with you longer uh, and be able to stay uh, on the job that much better. Now, um, uh, one other thing uh, that I wanted to bring out before I wrap things up is that the nice thing also about this is keeping your uh, uh, components up to date is very good because most of the components that are available out there are younger than uh, three years old, but yet most of the vulnerabilities that have been discovered are in older components. Now, Jess Humble, uh, real quickly, he came up with the book, Continuous Delivery, uh, and uh, some of the things he uh, specified or talked about there is automation, being able to continue to improve, uh, prove things out. Uh, uh, well, automation just really helps you to be able to keep those practices in place. Um, and, and so those organ those companies that are able to do this or really be able to achieve, say, a 55% reduction in risk in their components, uh, going from about 20.1 to under 10% 10, uh, 10 risk out there. So imagine quality at an insane speed. Uh, imagine an automated rating of OSS components. So you can look at it and say, do I want to choose a two-star component or a five-star component? Uh, and then also imagine secure applications, uh, maybe even machines writing their own code uh, and, and being able to pick out those best components and utilize them specifically. So I'm going to stop there, uh, and I wanted to give a, uh, a, a quick link to that report I was talking about, that our software su supply chain report. And if you have any other questions or want to continue the discussion, there's my uh, data there. Hey, Paul. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. We had a question from the audience. Aaron Schmidt asked, how much of this borrowed code that's in the open source ecosystem has been shown to purposely have uh, built-in vulnerabilities or backdoors? You know, that's a really great question, Aaron. Uh, I don't have statistics on that. Uh, I do know that that is certainly a factor that's out there. Uh, and, and so it is something that we need to be aware of. I, I'd say um, most of what we see out there probably is not malicious, but uh, I do know that there's a certain a certain amount that, that is. And a great uh, example of that, just this last week, there was uh, an announcement, uh, something called the octopus uh, uh, virus that is uh, something that's um, put into, uh, injected into code through one of the IDEs. So, you know, it's definitely something that needs to be aware of and, and that's stuff that we can help track and keep, uh, keep an eye on. Thank you for the question. All right. And um, I don't see any others in the chat. So let's go over to Tony Diaz for the raffle. So um, I'm actually really curious about that. You, you talk a lot about the, uh, uh, the difference between um, moving uh, moving quickly and uh, uh, and moving smartly, right? That seems to be kind of the gist that I get is that is that is it smarter for me to have less dependencies that I'm updating in less time, or um, should I just let dependencies go wild and just make sure that I'm patching? And so, is that kind of the spectrum you're trying to outline there? Well, and, you know, uh, that's a great question, Chuck. Uh, this is Chuck, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, great question there. Uh, and, and so really what we look at it and say, because it's a software supply chain, we want to be able to manage that across the whole spectrum. One of the things that Edward Deming uh, recommended was that you don't try to inspect quality in at the end. You make sure that you have good quality parts coming in at the beginning. And so we want to look at it at that same perspective and say, let's make sure you have good com uh, quality parts coming in, i.e. good components. The, the challenge that we see, uh, that we often run into, uh, that, that, that companies will sometimes uh, put into practice is what we call a scan and scold model, 
right before they deploy into production, they'll scan it and find out that there's vulnerabilities in those open source components. And then they have to go back to the developers and say, oh, we need to fix this. Uh, in the meantime, you're delaying a, a release or you, you're not delaying a release and releasing with, uh, with the vulnerable code out there. Uh, and so what we really recommend is that you are doing this scanning of your components throughout that whole process, starting with the developers, either in their IDE or as they're looking at um, these different components inside the open source repositories, that they can catch those things at that point in time uh, and, and, and in essentially avoid injecting a bug uh, into the code, then it has to be uh, fixed at a later point. If you get those good quality components at the beginning, either selecting the right components uh, because you know the the uh, history or in, in the uh, quality of the team working on it, or you can simply find those uh, components through through uh, a scan uh, uh, at that point. Then then you're able to really be able to uh, achieve that up front and not inject those bad components in, into that process. Does that make sense, Chuck? I think so. I think so. And, you know, what that kind of really makes me think about is it makes me think of obviously struts, right? Yes. Like, so, so as a, as a professional who's, who's been working in the open source community for, for so many years, um, what's your, what's your perspective on, on how to protect yourself from something like that? I mean, it gets missed by everybody, right? Well, it certainly can be, uh, and, and so that's one of those things that you know we we highly recommend that you find a good uh, solution for being able to uh, do that scanning for you, uh, and, and uh, not only that it, it can identify those those issues, but that it helps you give gives you that remediation advice to say here's how I fix this, here's how I can go in and. Uh, not put this problem into my code and avoid that vulnerability. Sometimes it's you can upgrade to this particular version. Sometimes it's going to be here's a workaround that you can avoid this with. But uh, you know, so really, you know, really, you're thinking you're thinking that the solution is to is to just get the code scanned before it ever even goes into into say Artifactory, right? Like yeah, like to interject between those two. So what do you do about legacy environments? Well, that's one of the things that you can also be looking at uh, as well. Uh, you know, uh, we, we advocate scanning throughout that whole process. Again, one of the things that uh, Deming uh, recommends is that you have, uh, you, you never pass a defect downstream. And, and so we're able to go in and recommend that you do that scanning up front with the developers, but then every touch point, every time you do a build, every time you do deployment, whether it's into the testing pipeline or into production use, that you do those scans as well. And we can also do scans of what you have in production uh, and be able to monitor those uh, applications, uh, those open source components in production use uh, on a daily basis so that if anything pops up, new new vulnerabilities out there, because they do pop up all the time, uh, that, that you're able to catch those and say, oh, I know exactly which applications have this component, so I know what to go off and fix. Understood. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your study with us. Um, I, I was really interested to see the scientific side of open source. That was kind of fun. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for the opportunity. Excuse me. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chuck. Um, next up are our friends at NowSecure. So June Nijar is an enterprise account executive and home automation geek. Please ask him about his 65 switches. And uh, he's also here to tell us a little bit about NowSecure. June, if you'd like to uh, tell us about NowSecure. Hey, thanks, Sean. So yeah, outside of <clears throat> being a, a home automation geek, um, I'm a sociologist by education and a cybersecurity account executive by trade. And so you might ask yourself, what's a sociologist doing selling cybersecurity products? Um, I, I fundamentally believe enterprises have a responsibility to society, to its people, to do what's right, to provide their customers and partners security and privacy. And so over the course of the last seven years, I've worked with organizations to stand up security operations, data protection, uh, and application security capabilities for their digital enterprise. So today, with Now Secure, I help my community, partners, and customers solve mobile application security challenges. Our mantra uh, at NowSecure is to save the world from unsafe mobile apps. For over 10 years, U.S. government, banking, financial services, healthcare, and retail companies have all been protected by NowSecure solutions and services. Our intent today is to share how organizations are leveraging mobile applications as a part of their digital transformation 
and to show how to build a mobile application testing program to ensure your employees and customers are protected while they use mobile applications. So with that said, Tony Ramirez is a now secure senior mobile application uh, analyst, and he's going to talk to you about building a mobile pen testing program. If you're interested in learning more about now secure our mobile application security offerings or just want to chat with us about how we can help you with your mobile DevSecOps journey you can find us on linkedin or by going to nowsecure.com our contact information will be available after this as well um, so with that tony my 90 seconds are up the floor is yours thank you june i'm tony ramirez let me share my screen and uh kick things off And can you see my slides? Yep. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yep. So yeah, um, I'm Tony Ramirez, Senior Application Security Analyst at NowSecure. Just to give you a little background on who I am, I've um, been working at NowSecure for about four years. Uh, you know, I like cooking, I like music, uh, like most people. Probably didn't, didn't really start my career in uh, security. I actually started it in, uh, you know, I thought I wanted to be a musician, then I thought I wanted to be a physicist, then uh, I got into IT. Um, and that, you know, is honestly kind of how things go. And, uh, you know, wouldn't change that. Uh, a little information about now secure. Uh, you know, June kind of gave you all the spiel, but if there's two things I can tell you is, uh, you know, we have just like an awesome open source offering um, to kind of build on like, like what we are. It's really a research team. Uh, if, if you walk away from this and you kind of think like, well, what, what do I do next? Recommend checking out Freedom Radare. They're awesome open source tools, uh, commonly used to do a lot of mobile application security testing. And uh, again, highly recommend checking them out. So just to dig in, uh, last couple of years, mobile's kind of been blowing up in the news. And I can tell you that because I've been in this space for maybe about six years now. Uh, when I started, uh, really there wasn't really anything coming up about like mobile in terms of you know news breaches things that would show up in the media things that would you know register being on like TechCrunch or something else but in the last couple of years you know it's really blown up mobile's kind of become the new hotness it's really the thing that you know i think a lot of people see as this you know interesting thing to go after in terms of attack surface uh and, and that has a lot to do with the fact that it is pretty vulnerable. Uh, it is kind of this thing where, you know, a, a few years ago, somebody would have said, oh, you know, like the web application is your, you know, your main goodness. And you're like, that's where everyone's going after. Um, and that was true for a long time. And now, you know, attackers are kind of shifting perspective and they're saying, oh, hey, uh, you know, they've spent a lot of time securing their web application, but maybe not as much time focusing on their mobile app. Uh, you know, why don't we go after that instead? And to kind of go along with that, um, mobile is still like really new. Um, you know, it's really only about 10 years old, maybe 12 now. And, uh, you know, we we're working with the university recently and uh, they, they were sharing some statistics. And I thought this was awesome because uh, what they found out was they did a bunch of analysis on Android apps on the App Store. And of these like 1.3 million, they found 15.4 had copy paste code from Stack Overflow. And of that copy paste code, 98% of it had a vulnerability, had some insecure code snippets. And that tells you that, you know, the maturity there is still not there. Uh, there's a lot of bad code. There's a lot of things to be aware of. And, and again, these were Android apps on the App Store. These weren't just, you know, some random apps. These were on the App Store. Um, to go along with that, you know, a lot of, the analysis we do on the app stores, you know, we've tested somewhere between, you know, uh, in like any given day, in any given month, we probably test somewhere around like 10,000 apps per like week. Um, but when we do like analysis on all those apps, we found about 85% of them have at least one security flaw. Uh, recently, we've also found out that about 73% of them have some privacy flaw that conflicts with GDPR or CCPA. So that's huge. That's really huge. And I think it really comes down to that a, a lot of developers uh, and companies that are kind of getting into the space don't really, you know, like they're not actively wanting to make bad apps. They're not actively wanting to, you know, introduce in, you know, insecure issues into their mobile apps. 
but uh, I think it, it kind of stems from, you know, understanding the mobile ecosystem because mobile is really different than web. And a lot of people who are coming into the space are coming in from the web world. Um, so when we look at the mobile ecosystem, it's really, you know, easy to think that it's, you know, it's like mobile apps, the OS, the device, and then you have the network and its backend. And, and that kind of introduces kind of some conflict there because, you know, for me, the first thing I usually will tell people when they get into the space is that, you know, you, you have this idea of like, you know, the device and the app, and you might think that, oh, well, the device's security really is the same as the app security. And the truth is, is those two things are very different. Um, that's because really like there's different skills involved in getting into like device security, there's different goals. And, and really in like app security, you have a way different level of control. And when you start breaking it down and thinking about how you as a developer or you as a security team for a mobile app, uh, what, what you actually have control over in terms of what your users do or what those devices do, um, again, you begin to realize, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into play. Uh, for instance, you know, like, that app is going to end up on a device and you have no guarantee that that device is in fact a, you know, a good device. And what I mean by a good device, it might be an old device that's not getting updates because, you know, updates really are uh, determined by the manufacturer. Even on, you know, iOS, if you have an older iOS device now, like a 5S or, you know, iPhone 6, you might not be getting updates anymore. Uh, but not only that, you know, you have rooted jailbroken devices and, you know, you kind of have all these other issues that kind of come into play that, you know, you might not even be aware of. And that kind of brings us to the other thing. You know, there are other apps on that device and you have no guarantee that those apps are in fact good apps. And I'm not just talking about malware. You know, malware is an issue, but it's not as big an issue as, you know, um, some of the other things like market data apps or, you know, fake VPN apps or things that kind of portray themselves as legitimate apps, but really aren't malicious in the sense that they're going to exploit your device, but they're malicious in that your users are going to consent to giving their information for free in exchange for some free service coming back. Um, perfect example of that is something like a like market data app where, you know, you have a application and it's offering, hey, if I, if you install our app and you install this profile, we'll give you a $5 gift card to to blah, blah, blah every month. And, you know, just keep that app on there. But in reality, that app's collecting data about your users. It might be collecting data about your app. It might be collecting data that really you don't want seen. And, you know, that's something that really comes up to being part of the user's decision. And of course, you know, where that app connects to, that device, uh, you know, will end up connecting to some insecure Wi-Fi. And, you know, the coffee Wi-Fi is always the obvious example, but the real one now that's becoming more of an issue are malicious USB chargers. Uh, malicious USB chargers are really interesting because they become this kind of new threat vector where, you know, uh, at the last Black Hat, uh, they were showing how you could create a USB charger the same size as a normal USB charger, but when somebody would plug into it, it would automatically jailbreak or root your device based on the information it could collect based on when it's connecting in. Now, I can tell you for a fact that, you know, Maybe I'm willing to bet like eight out of 10 people right now on this call have probably plugged in to a USB charger because you know their phone was about to die. They're at the airport and they're just like, oh my gosh, I can't go on the airplane. I need to listen to Spotify. I need to listen to something. And if I don't have my phone charged up, I'm not gonna be able to do any of that. And you charge up and you don't even think about it. Um, and you know, that's part of that. But of course, worst one of all is who's actually using that app? Who's using that device? the person who's behind the screen. Uh, you have no guarantee who they are. Uh, you know, it could be an unsuspecting user. It could be some curious kid who just wants to see if they can get free loot boxes. It could be somebody like me who's just curious, wants to see how the app works. Or, you know, you could have a real criminal who wants to steal information, who wants to understand how the wor app works and actually kind of play it off as their own. Um, again, these are all things you don't have control over as somebody who's creating an app or, you know, helping that app's development team. So when we actually start breaking down that attack surface and what actually goes into mobile, what actually is the stuff you need to protect 
in terms of that mobile app, we start thinking about app code, we start thinking about data at rest, you know, the data that's going to be stored on the device, you start thinking about data in motion, and you know, those components that go along with that. And you know, when we start thinking of all the threat vectors that come into play with that, you know, we start thinking about how somebody might attack the device, or the app, or other apps on the device, or even the network itself and those components that the net, you know, the app connects to, whether it's in the cloud, or it's some first back, uh, first party backend. So when we start digging into those issues, we kind of start seeing, you know, you know, we have these data at rest issues, we have these data in motion issues, we have these like backend API issues and code functionality issues. And really it's kind of broad because you, know, you have code that's going to run on a device remotely. It's kind of like publishing it out there, throwing it out into, you know, the, you know, the jungle and hoping that nobody picks it up and kind of, you know, scrutinizes it, but somebody will. That's the reality. And, and it's easy kind of to break these things up into four high level categories. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, a, there's kind of an easier way to kind of break things up. And, that, and that's kind of my first recommendation. If you're going to you know, start an AppSec program, one thing that's really useful is kind of try to break these things up. Try to think of things in terms of, you know, this is part one, part two, part three, part four. Because, you know, the, really the things you need to know in mobile are kind of broad. And there's really not going to be one person who has all those one skill sets. You know, you're, you're going to need multiple people working across. So let's start off with that data storage, data at rest, um, what those issues are. And, and they're really common. I, I often refer to them as forensics issues because when I was in uh, grad school, um, what I, how I got into mobile was through digital forensics, through doing, uh, doing kind of programs around mobile application security, but from a forensics point of view. And for me, I realized, oh, like apps are storing ton of, like, tons of data on devices, but really they're storing them in an insecure way. Um, and, and one example is device system logs, which are accessible without, you know, root or jailbreak. Um, and those, you know, are really common to be kind of a leaky area for apps, whether there's, you know, stuff like credentials, other PII, session values, or, you know, cryptographic variables, you know, being leaked in system logs. Um, it's huge, like 73% of Android apps, 18% of iOS apps that we've tested, we've seen have those uh, system log data leakages. Not only that, but we're also seeing things like arbitrary code that you know, is being stored in locations on the device where other apps have access to, read and write access to. So if those apps can modify those files, they're able to change the runtime of your application. So when we start getting into what you're actually doing when you're testing these, uh, you're actually looking at you know, certain locations on the device, you know, uh, applications, mobile apps, to kind of go give you a high level view, have access to private application folders. On Android, they also have access to what's called the SD card, which is actually now emulated storage, which is also called shared storage, which is called external storage, even public storage. And it goes by so many different names, but what it is is it's just a shared you know, space for you, the user, and other apps to kind of use as a, you know, kind of a larger space to store data. You know, you also have backup, you have hardware back storage like the keychain, and then you have RAM. And of course, system logs, and I had mentioned that earlier. So when you're getting into that, you're looking for those sensitive values. Uh, what I recommend all, when you're doing this type of testing is not only to look for the value that you're looking for, but variations on that format. You know, don't look for just plain text, but look for Base64, look for the MD5, look for SHA-256, look for other formats. It's really common to find Base64 though, I will tell you. Uh, most applications will, you know, most developers will use Base64 for compression, and you know, they will often use that for sensitive data. Uh, not only that, but it is useful to get a jailbroken and root device, because if you have a jailbroken and root device, you can access those private application folders. You can see what's being stored there. You can see what's in the keychain. But it's not necessary for all the attack surface in mobile, because some of those areas are accessible without a jailbroken and root device. And finally, you know, exercising the app, actually logging in, logging out, seeing what happens when that app process has happened, is useful for understanding how that app stores data. So continuing on, let's talk a little bit about, a little bit about data in transit or network. Um, we're, we're really talking about the network communications that are happening from the client side. Um, you know, there is a total different component to this where we start talking about API and backend components. But what I'm really talking about is how your application is setting up those, you know, TLS sessions or not setting them up. Because in mobile, you know, you actually, as a developer, have to set up those connections and perform the validation prop, uh, 
validation processes properly. So what does that mean? You have to make sure your app is using, you know, HTTPS, but also performing a certificate validation process, doing, you know, hostname verification. Uh, and, you know, for certain apps that might mean doing certificate pinning. Um, not only that, but you have to consider that you have these third party endpoints that your application might be communicating through and you might have vulnerable network libraries. So all these come into play. And even then, this is where we see a lot of issues. One in five Android apps is communicating over HTTP. One in seven iOS apps is communicating over HTTP. That's huge. There are some insecure HTTP communications being sent, likely by at least you know, one app on your device. And I'm assuming that everyone has at least seven apps on their device. It's fairly likely. Um, but again, these are things that kind of fall through the cracks and they're really common and they really affect apps in a huge way. So if you're getting into this type of testing, you know, you want to test those different types of attack scenarios where somebody's using a self-signed cert to man in the middle you, or the realistic man in the middle scenario where they've purchased their own cert under their own domain and they're using that. You know, I can buy a, you know, CA cert for Tony.com. I don't own Tony.com, but I'm using it as a, you know, an example. Um, and, you know, I could use that, you know, at the coffee Wi-Fi or somewhere else. Or maybe I put it in the malicious VPN app and I make the whole situation even easier and don't have to go to the coffee house, you know? Um, but not only that, you know, these processes, these validation processes, uh, they're complex because they have to happen before and after login. You know, you have third party components that could be communicating only after login because they're there for crash analytics. Uh, you could have another component there that's just for validating your bank account information or something else. And, you know, those are things that you're not going to see unless you log into the app and kind of start doing this testing after you log in. And, you know, we're looking for like sensitive data types. We're looking for in interesting content types because, you know, like JavaScript is kind of uh, like a weird thing in mobile. HTML is kind of weird in mobile. Uh, you know, like depending on how those communications are made and how those communications are processed by the app, you know, uh, an HTML page that can be, you know, intercepted on a mobile app that, you know, isn't really validating whether it's from a first party source or a third party source or has been modified. You know, that's a really interesting attack scenario. You can really do some interesting phishing with that. The final thing I want to show you is if you're going to set this up at home, if you want to try doing this, you know, you want to turn around, grab your phone and try to go do this, you know, after the call. You know, one thing that's worth doing is, you know, kind of understanding what that might look like. So I have Midim Proxy here, you know, I can install the Midim Proxy CA on my device. And then, you know, I'm just intercepting stuff on my MacBook from, you know, before it reaches that backend server. I'm using Midim Proxy as an example, but you know, there's a ton of other, you know, more popular proxies out there, Perp Suite, Charles, uh, you know, there's a ton. But, and, and ultimately it's up to what your flavor is. There's no right tool, um, but there probably are wrong tools, but you know, most people know what the right tools are for this type of testing. Authentication, uh, we're talking about, you know, like, API testing, we're talking about backend, we're talking about a lot of issues that are really traditionally web issues. Uh, but it, it's kind of funny because you'd think that these are really well understood, but the reality is, is that they're, they're really not. Uh, a lot of the issues we see in mobile um, are things that are really like well understood in the web world. Uh, we don't see rate limiting. We see a lot of session token issues. When, I, when I've pen tested mobile apps, when I do pen test mobile apps, you know, session token issues, lack of like, like having a session schema in a mobile app is really common. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the point is to get the user into the app as easily and quickly as possible without them having to slow down, without them having to, you know, really mull over what is going on in this app. You know, they want to get the user in right away. So again, you know, the traditional testing that goes into this type of testing in mobile is really the same as what you're probably likely doing in web today. So if you have some experience, you know, doing some web API testing, then you likely have experience now doing mobile API testing. You can put that on your LinkedIn today. Uh, you know, if that's one thing you take from this session, you know, you can add that on your LinkedIn. But, um, you know, being aware that a lot of that testing has a huge overlap is important because it is a major issue. It is something that, you know, is a major gap in mobile. Finally, code quality. And, uh, you know, Code quality is a really interesting area. 
because it really is kind of a whole other kind of skill group in mobile because we're looking at you know that application code and the issues we're seeing are hard-coded crypto keys hard-coded you know credentials in the application uh the scariest thing is in my opinion client-side logic where an application kind of gives like over permissions within the app and an attacker can you know maybe sign a jwt to themselves through the mobile app because of some client-side logic not only that but you have these third-party components that get built into the apps because mobile apps are kind of like puzzles and people are pulling in third-party code to make their lives easier and sometimes you know those you know third-party components have a lot of issues a perfect example was zipper down that happened about a year and a half ago where you know there's no native way to do unzipping on either of the os's and there were path traversal issues in almost every third-party zip library and if you were doing any you know zip downloading or zip you know decompression in your mobile app then you were likely vulnerable to that issue um, not only that but we also get into looking at you know like the free security features because there's a lot of good like platform features in mobile that a lot of people aren't aware of and they should be taken advantage of. Finally, backdoor methods. And backdoor methods are things that get left into an app because you know they're QA functionality, they make testing easier, and they just get left in. And you know, they might be able to you know, cause a ton of issues in your app. Uh, when we talk, start talking about this type of testing, we're really getting into using more like developer tools, to be honest. We're talking about using disassemblers and decompilers, which aren't. Uh, but things like, you know, debuggers and developer tools like re-signing apps, uh, you know, looking at source code, looking at, you know, you know, using, using really like kind of a common terminal tools like strings and graph and kind of like O-tools to kind of understand how that app was built are a big part of that. But on top of that, you know, those reverse engineering tools like APK tool, Radare, Frida are really useful because they really give you the ability to do that black box analysis. And really that's super useful if you're doing any type of testing because you want to test apps how they run in the real world. And to give you some perspective, uh, when you're doing reverse engineering, especially like in the Android world, uh, in Android, you're usually going from Dex to Smalley to Jar. Dex is kind of like your Android machine code. That's what's being run by your application because it really your Android device is just running a pseudo Java machine uh, on it. Um, so in a, in a lot of ways, that's kind of like the Java bytecode. Uh, then that gets, you know, that can be converted down to Smalley code. Um, that's kind of like the, like in between intermediary between it and JAR. Uh, ultimately you can go back to JAR, but you lose more if you go back uh, than you would if you went to Smalley. And again, these are kind of the formats you might reverse engineer to. On the native code side, where we're talking about C, Objective-C or Swift or C++, because again, you can have that in Android, um, we start talking about disassembly. And, you know, that executable code, you know, looks kind of scary. It looks kind of, kind of looks like what we saw with the DEX code. But uh, when we disassemble it, we end up in assembly. And assembly, again, might be scary. Uh, again, uh, I often am looking at assembly and often am finding myself, okay, I have to take a step back. I need to take a deep breath. Uh, and, and that's, you know, uh, not crazy because assembly is a scary thing, um, but that is part of the black box reverse engineering process of you know doing anything with native code. So I kind of want to. We're coming up on a two minute warning. Cool, because I'm right at the end now. Um, so I wanted to leave you with like four tips to really walk away with if you really are interested in starting your own pen testing program. And, and really it starts with getting a rooted or jailbroken device. If you're really in to, interested in starting a pen testing program for mobile apps, you absolutely have to get jailbroken or rooted devices, um, especially like on the iOS side. Like it, it's just really, uh, like a lot of the open source tools you might wanna use really require that. Uh, the other thing too is like understanding that mobile attack surface is gonna help really broaden your understanding of like what you're protecting and how you should be protecting it. Because eventually you're gonna to get to this point where you wanna threat model what you're protecting. And if you don't understand the attack surface, then you really don't understand what you're actually doing. Um, and, and, and that kind of leads to this next point that none of this stuff makes any sense in the beginning. It's, you know, it takes time. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, there are a ton of good resources though. Um, OWASP has an awesome resource 
for uh, mobile security testing. It's called the MSPG. If you uh, go out and try to find some resources, I highly recommend starting there. Uh, they have a ton of great projects around mobile. Everyone's aware of the top 10, but not everyone's aware about the mobile security project. And it's an awesome project. And finally, I think like the most important one is like when you figure this stuff out, you know, help somebody else figure it out. You're going to have to eventually help a developer fix these issues. And we can, you know, we can make jokes like, oh, you know, like this app sucks or this code sucks or you know, all that. But the reality is we have to take a step back. We have to figure out you know, what actually is, uh, you know, like what's the issue and how can we help prevent it from recurring down the line? How can we, you know, be better security people and just be better people in general, you know, and, you know, kind of have empathy for, you know, who we're testing these apps for. But not only that, help level them up. And, you know, hopefully they'll go and they'll help somebody else level up and, you know, we'll all be, you know, really great at application security. Um, so, yeah, I'm Tony. Uh, I hope you reach out to me, you know, send me your questions, send me your recipes. I'm on Twitter. And, uh, you know, you can also reach out to me on my email, aramares at nowsecure.com. That's fantastic. Hey, Tony, can you run back to that, to that slide where you had the, uh, where you had the lab set up? Uh, um, have... This one, right? Yes. Would you be willing to come and do a talk on, on setting one of those up and like walk, walk a class through on how to do this? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to. Would yeah. anybody else be interested in seeing that? I would be really interested in seeing that. I'm the one sure. with the mic, so we're all going to see it. <laughs> yeah, all that's right. fine. Tony, we're... I'm, I'm assuming everyone's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think so um, we did have some some questions from the audience. If we want to go through those too, Chuck. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. But so, I would uh, definitely come to that come to that lab. That sounds like fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, that would be a ton of fun. Um, again, I like sharing this information because I know uh, who, I hope that it helps whoever listens, and I think everyone who's on this who's listening is getting some help from it. Um, so I, I'm seeing some of the questions. I'm just going to read them off. Um, and the first one I saw, at the, the first one that was submitted is, if you charge your phone using a USB from a PC, can your phone data be hacked through your PC? Um, so from a very broad point of view, maybe. Um, I mean, it's possible that there's some, you know, malicious software on your, you know, desktop, your laptop, and, you know, that's waiting for a device to connect. Um, there are things that would have to happen uh, again, l let's not assume that everyone's device is, you know, up to date and has every software patch ever made installed on it. Um, but there's ways to kind of get around, you know, the USB debugging features that require a user to kind of enable them. Um, but that is possible. Yeah. Uh, there are things that Android and iOS have done that kind of prevent that, you know, that USB functionality from being turned on from a data point of view and being only in a power mode. Um, but uh, really, that's only been the last couple years that they've started doing that. Um, so, you know, like uh, one thing that's uh, like a good habit to have is, you know, be aware of what you're connecting to, be aware of, you know, what that thing could be. Because it, again, it's, it's kind of like uh, the same, it kind of goes hand in hand with like when you're on your MacBook or your, you know, uh, you know, laptop or whatever, um, you're always trying to make sure you're not connecting to just any Wi-Fi. Um, but you know, that is totally a legit scenario. Um, the next one I'm seeing is how well does uh, Jira work for disassembling mobile code? Um, so I'm going to be real. Uh, I, I can never say that software same uh, it's I know it's like the, it's from, uh, it's, it's Godzilla's like villain um, with the three heads, but I know what you're talking about. It was that uh, uh, disassembler that was released at the last Black Hat or two Black Hats ago. I have not used it. Jira. I think I said it right that time. Um, I've not used it. I know some people who have. They've had some success with it. Uh, it does work for mobile, especially for native code disassembly. Um, but I don't have a ton of experience with it. I've mostly kind of played around with and like Radare, with Cutter. Uh, if you're kind of like interested in getting into like disassembly and all that, um, it, that is a good tool. Um, I would say Cutter is another good one. Um, and, and one thing that's kind of 
interesting to do is just build small like like C apps and then try to disassemble them and you know try to like you know try to kind of understand interpret what you've created. Um, it, it, it's really easy to kind of like if you understand what you did to kind of see what it's like to go back. It gives you kind of some respect for it because eventually like you know you can do a hello world but then eventually you're going to want to do something that's like oh I want to pull down like you know the blah 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 social media app and it's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of assembly and you'll probably be overwhelmed but you'll have an appreciation for what goes into actually you know figuring that out and again it's it's not anything that happens overnight it's something that takes a ton of time um yeah uh i'm seeing another question and it's uh can you provide some resource links on how to get started with mobile app testing um the one I will repeat again and I recommend is the OWASP MSTG, uh, the OWASP Mobile Security Project. Um, also, there's some good blog posts on Now Secure uh, that I've written. Um, so check those out too. They're, they're good because I've written some stuff on like really things that I've seen a lot of apps not do that they should be doing that are really easy, like easy wins. And, and I always call them like the uh, security analyst guide to this or that. Uh, those are pretty good. Um, and, and again, the OWASP Mobile Security Project is totally worth checking out. I'll add a link to it in uh, the slides and I'll share that with the uh, CSN people. We'll, we'll, post, mm -hmm. we'll post links uh, on our site mm -hmm. and on our YouTube. Happy to do awesome. that. Very awesome. Um, and yeah, um, but I think that's the last question. But again, if you- so, oh. You said you were into food, not to put you on the spot, but would you ever oh. add acid to oatmeal? acid to oatmeal yeah no that sounds interesting no, no. i mean i guess yogurt is right. kind of like i've had like yogurt like with cereal and that's kind of like lactic acid so technically i guess that that works um yeah uh like recently i guess let me think what have i what have i been getting into um well like the summer's rolling around and you know like uh, i have a smoker i got a smoker last year so right now I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I live in uh, like the Midwest and I live in Illinois. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not a lot of great barbecue. Come to, come to Texas. You know, I, you know I, 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 I can't compete with Texas barbecue, but, you know, what, what I can do is, you know, uh, you know, throw, you know, take, you know, do my kind of like offshoot version. That's never going to be as good, but, you know, to my friends and family are going to be like, oh, this is great. This is like the best thing I've ever had. I'm like, it's not the best thing I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I think Coretta, we're going to post uh, post resource links. I think we already answered that one. Um, Chuck, if you don't have anything else, Tony, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And um, I think we're ready to bring back other Tony with uh, the raffle to finish up. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, I guess I guess that's everything. Um, Hack the Box is going again in June, so um, if you're an offensive uh, security guy, please join us there. Um, also, uh, I'm putting some, together some ideas for our next talk. If you want to be our next speaker, if you're a member of our community and you have something interesting and passionate that you would like to share with us, um, I encourage you to, uh, to come and talk to me and Sean and Tony, and let's get you in front of the community and get your voice heard. Um, of course, your donations are always welcome. Uh, we also have a Slack channel if you want to hang out with us uh, there and, and share news articles and stuff like that. Um, this place is just getting bigger and bigger and more fantastic and more passionate people are, are putting their energy into it every day. Um, I am truly, truly privileged to, uh, to be in the company of people like yourselves. So thank you all very much. Thank you to our speakers, Paul. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, June. Thank you, Tony, for all coming out and, uh, and helping make tonight happen. It would not happen without intelligent, dedicated, and passionate people like you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks, um, everyone. Night, everybody. Make sure we get your, Good night. Make sure we get night, your, uh, your email addresses from the raffle winners. Good night. Yeah, we'll keep the session open until Sean reports that that's all done.
So did everybody get their, uh, we, did everybody report into their gifts or are we still missing somebody? Tony, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Tony, Tony Diaz, can you hear us? Yes, I am yeah. so sorry. I have a really bad habit of just talking into a muted mic. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, I, it looks like I got everybody. So um, thank you again, guys and appreciate you guys coming out for this evening. Okay, so that's awesome. So panelists, just before everybody goes, um, for those of you that are still online, um, Sean and Tony and myself are very open to your honest and candid and hurtful feedback. Okay, so if there was anything that you didn't like about the way things ran tonight, okay, I want to hear it. Um, please don't put my feelings at risk. I would rather throw an amazing event then miss out on an opportunity because I'll let my ego get in the way. Okay. So thank and don't tell me to my face though. Okay. <laughs> just, just write it down. I think that's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love so you guys. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Y'all have a good night. Yeah, thank you so much. Right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Have a good night.